The big decision is how you discover the destination VTAP IP address. The destination address needs to be mapped to the end host destination MAC address. The mechanism used to do this affects the scalability and VXLAN domain functionality. So we need some kind of control plane element. The control pin element of VXLAN can be deployed as, for example, flood and learn technique, uh, which is not a real control plane, or you can have an actual control plane that does not use flood and learn mechanisms, or even use an orchestration tool for VTAP to IP mapping. Many vendors implement this differently. Once the ingress VTAP has this information, it sends the packet onto the network to reach the remote VTAP. The ingress device, which can either be a hypervisor or, for example, a leaf switch, implementing the overlay virtual network, adds a number of headers, a VXLAN header, a UDP header, and eventually an IP header. The IP header is added once it finds out the destination VTAP IP address it needs to forward the packet to. The original packet, along with the additional VXLAN headers, looks like a regular IP packet, as it traverses the IP core. The source address is the ingress VTAP and the outer destination address is the IP address of the remote VTAP where the end host that we are trying to send to is located. The underlay core network routes packets based on the outer destination IP address, the destination VTAP address and does not need to track any end host reachability information. The UDP header contains a destination and a source port. The destination port is RFC defined 4789, but the source port is not defined and it results differently for each host. What value is used for the source port is a hash value of the payload. The VXLAN code takes values from the TCP IP or MAC headers, hashes them to a 16 bit value and then uses this value as the source port. This technique enables different sources on the same VTAP to have different source ports performing low balancing capabilities across the underlay physical network. For example, an end system, let's call it E1, sits within the logical layer 2 network and wants to communicate with a remote physical located end system called E3. The communication is initiated by the host E1 and carried out via the VTAP. Host E1 and E3 think that they're actually on the same layer 2 segment and have no knowledge or any understanding of the overlay network. To them, they are on a common Ethernet segment and thus behave as normal hosts would actually do. As a result, they send a typical Ethernet frame. The VTAP will have two interfaces. One interface connects to the standard layer 2 to the end system E1 and the other connects to the layer 3 underlay. Nothing major here and all the communication between E1 and E3 occurs over the layer 3 routed IP underlay network via an overlay tunnel. The ingress VTAP encapsulates the original Ethernet traffic with a VXLAN header and sends it to the remote egress VTAP where E3 is connected to. The remote VTAP performs the decapsulation, the VXLAN header, and prevents the original layer 2 packet to E3, the final destination endpoint. The layer 3 underlay network is completely unaware of any host reachability information such as the IP address or MAC address, and forwards VXLAN encapsulated packets between ingress and egress VTAPs.